thank you for uh, having to do this panel. You chose to discuss the sequel threat. We don't do that to that on Great Britain, which is um, just about to be tested to some of the city and cities. Um, so we're going to be talking about countries which are not going through a enormous census breakdown.
order to wish this political battle, we have to open up the communication bubbles in which we increasingly find ourselves. Right? The, the, the old right talks mainly to the old right. <laughs> the intellectuals, liberal, uh, well meaning people from the US, which is good how we put it, they talk to each other. They don't talk to the other side. So break up the communication bubbles because this constantly Kremlin narrative. Only is effective if we leave our communication bubbles and talk to the potential victims uh, on the other side of the fence. And here, well, some Western public media, for example, German public television, have to take it away. You remember the case of Mama with um, the famous case in Cologne, and I'm not talking about her case. Cologne, January 2016. Mass sexual harassment, sex, even rape in front of the Cologne Cathedral police stood helplessly watching sex. And these things were committed by 95% migrants in a big crowd celebrating the year. That was kept under wraps. The public German media did not report about it. Newspapers didn't print stories about it for three and a half days. Because why? Because it might not put in, who, of course, all the time, the Kremlin puts out negative things about migration, especially in the wake of the 2015 migration crisis. So after three and a half days, that's the social media, the story broke. And suddenly, there was a huge loss of confidence of the German public in German public media. So in order to avoid helping Putin, they ended up helping Putin. You know, I could continue this, but, but this, is, this is a just a nutshell. This, this, kind, this way of behaving is not breaking up communication levels. This is actually serving the alt right and other populist media and political parties, which again do the Kremlin's business, either on a permission because they have the other directly financed or, or, or supported by the Kremlin. So, you know, to wrap it all up, as much as concrete countermeasures and transparency legislation and uh, counter beating for the unnecessary things that may have to be done by civil society, they have to be done by governments and international organizations. But I think the whole effort to answer to Kremlin influence stands or falls with political leaders, with leaders that are credibly able to reclaim the narrative and to develop a counter story. Thank you for this interaction and for all being so much for raising some critical points because I'm going to be critical in my remarks as well. It's wonderful to see so many of you being interested in this topic. As we're speaking under the rubric of pitches and discussion, my pitch is that policymakers and scholars in Western democracies still need to understand our ambitions better. We don't understand them well enough. And if we're going to enhance the resilience of our democratic systems, we have to still study our adversaries' strategy as well as their tactics, especially with regards to their behavior in cyberspace. We don't know it well enough yet. In one very important area where more research is needed, especially in this field and um, the cyber behavior of our adversaries, is in relation to Russia's interference in elections, in election processes of Western democracies, through the use of cyber operations alongside other information and other measures. We need to study not only cyber strategy of our adversaries, and in this case, Russia's cyber strategy, through reading their uh, the final documents and reading the writings of military political scientists in Russia, but we also have to understand their tactics in, the, in cyberspace by studying their cyber threat actors and their behavior through the operations that they have launched against our own democracies. By studying and analyzing the anatomy of Russia's cyber tactics, we can understand better the motivations. Uh, behind the foreign policy and aggressive posture in cyberspace, and we can also identify the critical chapters of the Russian playbook where we can most effectively intervene and defend our system. And very briefly, I would like to answer to show you, to illustrate my point, I would like to answer three questions. First, where has Russia so far used cyber operations alongside other information warfare measures against election IT infrastructure of the other state and partner nations? Second, what information do we have about those cases so far? And what research is presented? And third, how would that additional research help decision makers? And I'll give you very briefly two examples. So, in terms of first, 
for executive cyber operations alongside other information workflow measures against election ID infrastructure. Probably all of you are familiar with uh, Russia's interference in the U.S. elections of 2016. Russian cyber threat actors were accused of breaching uh, the servers of the Democratic National Committee, also known as the DNC, in 2015 and 2016. The two Russian cyber threat actors that were implicated in those actions were APT-28 and APT-29, which are also known as Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear. The cyber community likes to give fancy names to, or funky names to those groups to make it a little more interesting. Um, but this is not the only case of such interference. You might have also heard speculation that Russia may try to interfere using cyber means again, again in the 2020 US presidential election. There are at least 10 other cases of Russian interference with the same set of actors and with very similar techniques in the election process of different states. And by those cases, I specifically refer to cases of Russia attributed cyber attacks against the election IT infrastructure in NATO member states and partners since 2007. Because there have been so many cyber attacks, this is how it's called in my discussion. And by election IT infrastructure, I mean the IT um, networks, systems, and cloud account services of politicians, political parties, and legislatures that are involved in elections. Some of those cases include the 2014 GDOS attack of the modern distributed network service attack against Ukraine's Central Election Commission. This includes the 2017 and 2016 um, interference and uh, intrusion into websites and servers of uh, the Montenegrin government. This also includes the 2015 GDOS attack against Bulgarian Central Election Commission and a few others. So, what do we know about those cases so far? Some of those cases are fairly well documented. For example, Probably the most well documented case is the interference in the US elections in 2016. Through Robert Miller's indictments and investigations, we have plenty of information to build the case and understand the, the different components of Russian cyber information operations. But other cases, such as um, the GDOS attacks and interference against the government of Montenegro or Bulgaria, are very quite um, under researched, and there's a lot more, um, there's a need to research those cases further. In addition, in the literature, there is still this marked division between information that just focuses on the technical aspects of cyber operations and literature that covers more the political aspects of cyber operations. And those two pieces of literature don't usually help each other. The people that write them don't usually help each other. So the technical literature is usually written by IT experts and it's read by IT experts. And usually it's produced by the private sector companies such as CrowdStrike, FireEye, and Macro and the first speaker for his file of interesting high quality reports where they talk about the tools, tactics, techniques, and procedures of Russian cyber threat actors, or also known as the TTTP of Russian cyber threat actors. But that literature is also full of jargon and is not very well understood by the political scientists and scholars who usually write the second type of literature, which is more focused on talking about cyber operations and positioning them in the context of Russia's foreign policy. So there's still a need to first study more study better the cases of Russian cyber operations, and second, bridge the gap between the technical and the policy in the future. Which brings me to my final point, which I'll very quickly cover, and I'll put some this mindful of time here, and I'm trying to be as well. Why is this important? Why do we have to study those cases better and incorporate the literature? So I have several examples, and I can talk about them in the Q&A. But for example, if you study Russia's efficient campaigns against different political parties, from my research, I would say there are these three cases of those operations. We can answer how much in advance of an election does Russia commence a fishing operation, a fishing campaign begins with fishing emails. So if we know, for example, that Russia starts sending fishing emails to particular individuals about a year before an election, then the chiefs of staff of political parties that are usually targeted will decide to train their staff into recognizing fishing emails so that they minimize the risk that such an operation will be. We, we, we use the term Mala and Indigo. That, that's the term that you can also, uh, our Russian colleagues right now know that we use it because that was actually on the agenda when the late Russian president came to the United Nations to have a conversation about what was the term in detail. Funny enough, so it tells us that you can write such a little down and then just write like some kind of Russian challenge that you would have in mind. You know, that's the whole spectrum. 
to do this, and then very quickly there was the emerge of evidence that that the public defense did very much try to influence them. All right, so there we go. This we use this, and, and there was this famous story of the uh, suicide rate in the various uh, moments and so on. So this is we can go back on that many things. Uh, we know as well, because we have been a target of attack again for many, many years. It's an old archive. Even, by the way, if you want to watch it, for me, you write cartoons, a lot of them are actually going to be great, you know, in a rather twisted way. So that's the However, of course, we, we uh, you know, there are reasons for it as well, because to take a cue from what Roland was saying, we can talk about the truth, about the techniques, Hybrid or not, but the point is that there's a whole continuum and a whole range of, 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 of tools being used for you know, corruption, espionage, you know, hacking, use for this information purposes, uh, and, and, and so on. However, it, it is true that from a strategic point of view, um, there is a particular good point, and hence that the target is uh, on the part of those who can do it. Of those threats that we have as societies, and there are threats that are identified as they go, that they typically are worried about. So, you might understand that I used to mention that our, you know, our uh, military capabilities, because uh, the bottom line is that we can talk and we should analyze and, 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 and get some descriptions. But, you know, if there was the stopping force in Spain in the 60s, there would be no war. In other words, you know, the, the, the essential element of your security matters because without that, you would not have a proper, um, proper uh, democratic process and all, all the rest of it. Uh, the question of um, situation awareness is very important. So I'll give you a very quick example of how the British complaint has worked in this country. Uh, you know, uh, and firstly, I would say it's not uh, the most lofty round of the Being naive or indifferent is not cool. It's, it's not a good uh, it's exactly the best way to get this thing. But the worst it can be dangerous because if you, you know, you know this, many of you from the younger generation will always remember those, you know, advertising and stop smoking, you know, kids and stuff. Yeah, right, you know, don't accept the drive with a friend and so on. But maybe this campaign should be organized for some people who have some indications and some strange of reason, you know, all this stuff. The various events of places like Russia and China is not a bad start, I would say, because if you understand that there is plenty of evidence there that we are being targeted, and it's no secret to do with that. Why? Because that is, uh, you know, the, for example, the very existence of democratic Ukraine is a problem for the kind of Russia that is, is the model that's been promoted. The same goes for NATO. In many respects, the same goes. Of course, it's the very essence of democracy, but it, it contrasts very heavily with the reality. I mean, we are here sitting in a nice place, 
which is A, attacking back. Now that raises some ethical questions, but if it's a real battle and a real war, one might have to talk about what that means. The second thing was um, discussing things such as 
infrastructure attacks. If it's coming at you from towers, take out the tower. Now, that's pretty aggressive. Uh, but those are parts of that conversation that I don't really hear a lot. Um, I'd be interested to hear your opinions on, on that study. And are we, when we talk about uh, disinformation, propaganda, uh, are we kind of as whistling past the graveyard that this is, that the amount of resources that, there be, that are being um, put on one side are, are overwhelming and the agendas being set? Is it, are we with a squirt gun against a, uh, a fire hose of, of falsehood? So first, thank you for bringing up this report. Um, I wasn't one of the authors. I didn't participate in the research. But I actually work closely with one of the authors of the report, who is Christopher Paul. And he'll be so happy to hear that you brought it up. The report is very short, and I recommend it to everyone. It basically explains how propaganda works and psychological aspects of that. I, um, we actually have also a Russian version of that report, and I printed it, and I went to a Russian military conference called Army 2018 in 2018, and I placed it on tables where I knew Russian military leaders are going to sit because I wanted to show them that we actually know what they're doing. Uh, so I think that some of them might have picked up the copies that I left. Um, I think that's a very important point, and uh, you raised so many interesting questions. But I will actually pose more questions instead of answering because I think the topic is really complex. And when we talk about attack back, first of all, do we know who we really are attacking? What are our targets? And do we know also the secondary effects of that attack? What would that cause to our integrity and to our argument that we're a democratic system that doesn't really use the same dirty tactics? Um, and that'll be, that'll be the question that I'm posing. I, I don't know on which side of the debate I stand. Sometimes, especially when it comes to cyber operations, I wish we were a little bolder. Uh, but I also think that there's still, there's still a lot of confusion and a lot of, a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of unknowns about how exactly we're going to do this and what exactly the reaction would be. Anyone else? R uh, Robert, yeah. Well, I mean, I could just pick up this <clears throat> this point. I mean, because of course, it's 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 not a good thing to hear that you have <laughs> you become more pessimistic because you you feel uh, this is you know like being on the losing side. Uh, if I can link it to this observation um, dilemma, as Roland put it, well, in the end of the day, it all starts with you know uh, with the if you like attribution and, and understanding of you know what's the nature of the beast, what is it that we're facing, and. And again, without being alarmist, without being, you know, going in a direction that, that would actually not help anybody because we just want to proceed living normally and we have something to defend. It's just our normal world life. But, I mean, if you, if you look at the, the recent interview of Minister Shoigu in this Moskowski Komsomolets, which is, you know, on, it's a tabloid, but a very popular one, well, he himself jolly admits that actually, you know, in, confrontation with us well before 2013. I mean, there is a limit to how, how, how long can one basically pretend that we are not under attack. We are. I mean, we are not attacking anybody. But that leads to a very simple uh, operation conclusion that, you know, you, you, <laughs> you, you, as I said, you can't be lazy, but you, you have to make a bit of an effort. It's, it's not an abstract issue. Secondly, uh, that raises an issue of the right of self-defense. So, you know, uh, if you take the cue of, 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 the, of the young Russians in Moscow who predominantly uh, form the part of those who protest, you know, this eternal battle in, in Russian information space between, as they put it, the fridge, right, and the, or the TV set and the fridge, those who don't know it, you know, you, you watch television and it's wonderful, then you open the fridge and it's pretty bad. But right now, uh, it's the fridge which is winning because the young people are just not watching the main propaganda channel. So, I mean, on our side, I mean, who is forcing people to watch Russia Today on their hotel rooms and so on? Nobody is forcing people to accept <coughs> dubious invitations, even if, you know, uh, no, I mean, it, I'm, I'm, this is not Director Roland. I know that he has full, you know, uh, tries his judgment, but it's, it's, it's a wider issue. In other words, it's about responsibility, it's about when it's, and it's, it's, however, it's at the same time, it, it is about actually doing something because, you know, not just responding, pretending that the problem is not there. That is the wrong policy. As I said at the beginning, it's not cool 
So, you know, all those elements have to come into play. The long term, the, you know, the media literacy, the educational part, uh, legislation even, when you want to protect, you know, you can make a choice if you, are, if you have worries that, you know, some funny things will happen to the electronic voting vote, like in the Netherlands and so on, uh, and many other aspects. But again, I stress the same thing, you know, you, we always have a choice, and that's what we're good at it. We're supposed to be. We're good at making choices because that's natural for us. It's the other guys who should worry because they're not particularly uh, well uh, formatted for that. Merlin, did you want to say something? Uh, just, just one extremely brief. No, I don't have it. Oh. Yeah, so, sorry, but they, they need this microphone for the audience. So what is a dubious invitation, Robert? I mean, you give me, the, give, give me the book on dubious invitations. I mean, I'm provoking here, of course. <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's an alive question for any researcher. And, you know, again, why don't we, of course, we could counter attack in, on that area too and rather invite maybe some Russians we feel we can talk to. NATO does it all the time, right? So maybe that's one way to respond. Well, the, um, we don't invite propagandists, for example. Um, uh, two points. One is on the, um, on the uh, uh, question of hitting back uh, to uh, intrusions. Uh, I think we, of course, we need to uh, distinguish uh, what is attacked on our site. Is it part of our critical, let's say, information infrastructure? You know, election systems, for example, clearly is. Um, uh, or is it something else? Uh, but, uh, you know, if you know, under international law, they, uh, as the law stands right now, uh, when you are under cyber attack from outside, you can attribute that, you can also use countermeasures in order for our site to stop. Uh, uh, when this attack is already over, you can use a, what is in international law called retortion, uh, which are basically uh, legal but very unfriendly acts like expelling Russian diplomats what the Western community has done uh, quite often. But of course, that all rests on the assumption that you can attribute a, a cyber attack to a specific actor, which is very often, and I think this is, I would say that this is partly a myth, but only partly, that its attribution is very, very hard or impossible. But when you see, actually, US uh, attorneys are indicting specific people on a, it's a quarterly basis, a couple of times a year, specific Chinese, Russian, and so forth are indicted for specific cyber intrusions into uh, US systems. Another is basically, I mean, Robert uh, brought up this uh, uh, competition in Russia between the free, the free age and the TV. And that brought to mind, mind a, um, actually one uh, story which um, is also from Russian origin and gives you an idea of how the information uh, uh, warfare can uh, act, uh, work in a very sublime and very kind of nice manner. And uh, this, uh, this, this story uh, is basically about a, a fox and a turtle. So obviously a fox wants to eat a turtle, but turtle has a shell, he can't. So um, turtle is sitting in his living room, watching on TV, which basically says that fox, <laughs> not fox TV, uh, that fox is a very it's a nice try. Uh, but fox is a very friendly animal. You know, it's a very beautiful animal, has nice cubs, you know, good neighbor. When that doesn't work, next week he sees on a TV uh, a news flash that all the foxes of the world has, have become vegetarian. That still doesn't work. The third week, he saw on TV a commercial where basically turtles who have shedded their shell, claim that they can now fly. And they show how turtle flies without a shell. This is a way, actually, to get into the minds of people. Speaking of dubious invitations, we had a case a few years ago in Poland where we had a Polish MP who, when he was in the European Parliament as part of the Le Pen-Nick Griffin caucus, uh, went with a delegation from the so-called European Center of Geopolitical Analysis, which is a think tank connected with Alexander Dugin, um, who organizing these election monitoring missions 
went to as a monitor to Russia to monitor a Russian presidential election and then wrote an article in the Polish media saying that in many ways Russian elections are fairer than Polish elections. Uh, and he was subsequently made Deputy Minister of Defense for several years until only a couple of years ago. Shouldn't we stop pretending that the main threat to our resilience is external rather than internal? Because no one forced him to do any of those things. Oh, we should absolutely start talking about this. In fact, I think we are. In most, most Western discourse about the threat to liberal democracy, there is an internal angle. And again, you know, this is very often exploited and used, utilized, supported by the Kremlin, but it's not caused by the Kremlin. It is helped by a lot of domestic factors. Uh, you know, the way globalization has benefited only part of our populations, um, the way the internet has facilitated the emergence of communication bubbles and opinion bubbles consequently. So, uh, you know, there is, and, and there is, I'm coming back to this point about German public media and so on, there has been something that I would call liberal overreach, right? There is illiberal liberalism, let's face it. There are places in our societies, you know, academia in Anglo-Saxon countries, for example, where there is such a pressure on not stepping away from a certain, what the Swedes call, opinion corridor, that resistance against that kind of illiberalism becomes terribly seductive to very intelligent people. And then, of course, this is a beautiful entry gate for authoritarian thinking, and, and you know, Viktor Orban uh, is, is, is claiming is the defense of Christian Europe. Uh, uh, you know, undermining the rule of law, weakening checks and balances in his own country, uh, monopolizing uh, a print media, for example, it's a fact now. And yes, by coincidence, he's also on very good terms with Vladimir Putin. Uh, and in the EPP. But, but, but the, yes, the threat comes from the inside and it's, it compounds the external threat to liberal democracy. But then, again, this is my personal special point that I keep returning to. You know, liberal democracy has not been doing itself a lot of favors in the last couple of decades since the end of the Cold War. You know, there has been overreach, and um, uh, um, I think we, we have to reestablish pluralism, and as I said, breaking up the communication bubbles. That means also inviting one or the other, uh, even populist or Viktor Orban, to talk shows on television, in German public television, you know? That these are things that need to be done even if they seem painful and they seem to temporarily legitimate, legitimize the other side. And yet, I think in the long run, uh, kind of strengthening pluralism within Western societies will make them more resilient against the attempts to weaken them from the outside and the inside. Uh, That's Fen a very good Fen point. Um, just one uh, uh, sentence to add to it, and, uh, and it is that uh, we should keep our eye both on uh, Putin's useful idiots and just people who are just idiots. Very short, very short point. Um, I completely agree with Roland. I believe Russia is capitalizing on our own vulnerabilities. And one of the issues that we should address, in order to enhance our resilience, we have to be better at information sharing. Both governments and the private sector are guilty of that. They're not sharing information about, for example, Russian cyber attacks that is very valuable to researchers who are trying to analyze Russia's playbook. I agree and I disagree with Roland. Because it's true that what he described, and we all agree, right? We have various challenges which are, which are important long term, but they are our challenges, right? We can have an endless debate, which is not the topic of this conversation about the whatever various weaknesses of our, our current, you know, democratic processes, the kind of leaders we got, whatever, whatever comes to your mind. But these are our problems. But here we're discussing, indeed, the copy, uh, you know, uh, an attempt, a very thought through strategy with the use of a huge array of very dangerous, very pernicious tools uh, in order to 
essentially undermine any work, any debate that we might be having about how to fix our problems. It's about, uh, you know, distorting uh, the, the, the actual reality, so to speak. And third, some of it, these challenges are very direct. So in other words, yes, we have to work, but the problem, you know, on, the, on those long-term issues. However, it's like, you know, if you're driving a car and something's leaking, is that right? But when you have whatever, uh, uh, you know, a log, you know, a tree log, basically you have to go and clear it because otherwise you won't be able to drive. So I don't think there is actually, I mean, it's, you have to do this and that, but let's not mix what's, what, what, what is something that it's, it's our responsibility as part of fixing our house, so to speak, and, and then when somebody tries to break in and say, by the way, you know, we have a bit of a mess, that's not your problem, mate, you know, have a go and, and look in your living room because it's, yeah. What if one of your children has invited them in? Well, I think uh, that, 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 would, that would lead to an extremely serious discussion, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, the parent-child relation. But my, my sons are grown up, so I'm, I'm sure they wouldn't do that. Any other questions? Back. There's two at the back. Maybe we'll take them both, but very quickly. Hello, I'm Ilya Korsenko from Kazan University. Uh, I um, want to bring up the saying that in peace, prepare for war but I want to reverse it in war, prepare for peace. I um, have a personal memory of uh, doing an internship with the Council of Europe in Moscow program office and the delegation from Strasbourg came to monitor how the uh, local governance was uh, delivered. Uh, representatives of Yabloko, Parnas parties were there, Ilya Yashin was there. And by the end of the meeting, they came out very dissatisfied with the way the uh, delegates from Strasbourg were not prepared in terms of knowledge how the local governance worked in Moscow. They asked very plain and general questions. And I just recall this dissatisfaction. And um, my question will be just about how not to miss out the opportunity uh, to act uh, in time when the change happens and to be prepared for dialogue with the um, new Russian elite, new Russian government, uh, however you wish to see it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yes. Uh, hello, my name is Frederick Lettkust. I'm ambassador for countering hybrid threats at the Swedish uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I have a question which sort of, uh, I want to broaden um, the discussion and the context a little bit because this is a session on resilience and has been very much on, on information on cyber. Uh, I think uh, uh, cyber and information can be two important manifestations of these hostile state actions or, or hybrid threats that we are faced with, but they're not only, we cannot reduce it to that. And the interesting things we have to connect the dots because they can these hybrid threats can manifest themselves in many ways, from illicit financing, corruption, sabotage, killing people, uh, cyber attacks, disinformation. So, but it only becomes interesting when we connect the dots. And that leads me to to the second part of this question: is that uh, we have to understand, we have to detect the threat and understand the threat. That's the first part. The second is we have to build resilience, but the third part is we have to do something about it. We have to counter it. We have to change the cost-benefit calculus on the other side. And we can only succeed if we do that in a holistic manner, not only going each, you know, individual manifestations, because the manifestations are only means. We have to get something against the goal. So my question to the panel is, are we getting better uh, collectively at connecting dots and detecting and understanding the threats? And the, the, the second part of the question is, are we getting better at actually having a holistic, thought through, systematic response on how we can change this cost-benefit calculus? Thank you. We, we only have a basically no time. So, <laughs> um, if you could, all of you, very quickly, if you, if you have something to say, summarize it in the context, similar to this question yeah. of, uh, is the direction of travel positive? If we are having a resilience crisis, do you think that we're starting to move in direction or we've at least arrested um, downward trajectory? No, I think the glass is half full, but the other side has also, also has a learning curve. You know, I mean, the Kremlin's efforts today are more sophisticated and, and better suited to our weaknesses than they were uh, in 2014, let alone in the 2000s. So it's, the, the jury is out. But, we, but I think we've at least woken up to the threat. Um, now, on, on the question of preparedness for the time when things tip over in Russia, absolutely. Oh, we don't know when that moment will come, 
and, and yes, there is, a, there is a, already a beginning rhetoric from Kremlin people, the so-called Kremlin liberals, whatever that means, uh, who sarcastically turn around to us and say, you think you're going to get anything else but Putin after Putin? No, Russians are Russians. You know, it's this kind of determinism, which is another narrative that we have to combat. And I think um, uh, Vladimir Milov and, and other Russians at this conference have been doing great work in combating this and helping us to, and giving us arguments to, to combat this. But indeed, we need to prepare much better. Uh, and, and the other thing is you know, connecting the dots and doing something. Absolutely the core. But we will never, and we shouldn't even try to reach the perfectly hierarchical, top-down, all-coordinating approach of the Kremlin. Our response to malign influence from Russia will always be, to a degree, chaotic, uncoordinated, and with friction losses. This is unavoidable. This is the price we pay as free societies, and we have to somehow bear with it and make the best of it. I will address the last question. It's a great question, and I think we're getting better at connecting the dots. For example, there isn't a clear definition of what information warfare is, but in the Russian literature, there are a lot of there's some military science that shows information warfare, which in Russian is informacionne protivoborstvo, has two parts. One of them is psychological, specifically exerting psychological effect on your adversary, and the second is digital, exerting digi um, eroding the digital environment, which is for cyber operations. So the psychological and the cyber, according to some Russian experts, military scientists who are influential in Russian's policy, are the part of the same thing. So I completely agree. We're getting better at connecting the dots. There's still a lot to, to do, but we're at least being aware of the threat. I'm all in favor of connecting dots as long as it's not a sort of color book, you know. I mean, this is serious stuff. So doing things is actually very important. And, and now it's really uh, important for Mayma Roland. It, in all this, you know, we, in the end, we can only strive towards perfection. But if you try too hard, you end up, you know, uh, with various kind of excuses not to do things. And in the end, I really would like to, you know, uh, on a and then a message of, you know, we need to be more confident because we have all the arguments and our, uh, if you like, narrative, our model is better. And it's, you don't have to take our word for it, but you ask the people, so to speak, on the side. And the funny thing is that if one gets various glimpses what the people from particularly those countries who are at the forefront of this malign influence say, Recent, uh, I think it was Levada opinion poll in Russia, 58 percent, you know, and that's across Russia, across different age groups, said human rights, freedom is more important than prosperity. Hello. You know, so let's not get in trap that we're going to be more pessimistic than other guys. And then as far as China, well, we all been watching what's happening in Hong Kong and let's not underestimate uh, that. So horroring book, no, but getting to know, and frankly, I think we have made enormous progress. So anybody who just say, I don't really know what we're up to, I would just simply suggest do some reading and, and there are various portals and things. We, we really know what we're up to. So it's stress right now should be on, on, on responding. Uh, yes, we are, I agree, we are getting better uh, and doing something about it. Uh, it was just three days ago when um, the companies um, uh, connected to Yevgeny Prigozhin were uh, hit with another round of American sanctions. Um, and I think there is now kind of look at what Wagner Group is doing in uh, places like Central African Republic, which I would say a couple of years ago we would not have paid attention to. So I think uh, we're getting better. Uh, I think there is a, a dialogue has been ongoing for many years with what uh, is, let's say we could call a, a, a liberal uh, side of, of Russia at conferences like this, uh, like in, in Tallinn at Leonard Mary conference, where, for example, Boris Nemtsov was a regular until, until he was um, uh, shot. And I think uh, we are getting better in understanding what Russia is up to, but I would leave you uh, with a problem, and that is that I don't think that our societies at large understand what China is up to. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll leave it there. I don't think we'll discuss China right now. Um, so sorry we overrun slightly, but uh, thank you so much for coming.